Welcome to the History Extra podcast. Fascinating historical conversations from the makers of BBC History magazine. Have the Anglo-Saxons always been called the Anglo-Saxons? What did it take to make or break an early medieval king? And how did the arrival of Christianity on the shores of the British Isles revolutionise the governance of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms? Speaking to Emily Briffitt, Joanna Storey, Professor of Early Medieval History at the University of Leicester, answers your top questions on the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Hi Joe, thank you so much for joining me on the History Extra podcast. Delighted to be here, Emily. So we are going to be delving into listener questions all about the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And the first question we've got is one from Instagram. And that is, what do we mean when we're talking about the term Anglo-Saxon? The term Anglo-Saxon is one that historians use to describe the period before 1066, that is, before the Norman Conquest. And to we use it as a term to describe both the peoples, the kingdoms and the culture of the period at that time in the area that eventually became the Kingdom of England. So it's a term that's very specifically used for that pre-conquest period. And it's, in fact, really important that we contain the use of the term Anglo-Saxon to that early period, because sometimes it is a word that's used in other contexts, in even in contemporary contexts. And that's really often not very helpful because it's a, a, a label that we prefer to have defining this early period of English history. So before the Norman Conquest of 1066. And are there any other names that we should know about for these people? Well, in fact, Anglo-Saxon is a term that we get used first, really, in the early 10th century systematically, though before that it is used, interestingly, in continental context, um, in context coming actually from from Rome. Um, So it is a label that is contemporary with the period, though comparatively late in uh, in the Anglo-Saxon period. Um, Other terms that come up at the time Um, are, in fact, the word English, which is used particularly by Bede, writing his ecclesiastical history of the the English people. But even that, in fact, was uh, papal terminology uh, from the time of Gregory the Great, round about 600. So English is a collective term that's also used for for this period, but it does change over time because we're talking about a period of five or six hundred years. So Anglo-Saxon England as a kingdom in its own right really emerges in uh, the middle part of the 10th century. So round about you know, 900 to about 950 is when we get England as a an independent and unified kingdom uh, in its own right. Before that, we're talking about multiple kingdoms, changing boundaries, changing borders over time. And the people who lived in those kingdoms at that time would almost certainly have thought of themselves as belonging to those kingdoms rather than having an overarching English identity. So we might have talked about the Northumbrians, we might have talked about the Deirans or the Benitians or the Mercians. People might have thought of themselves as belonging to a tribal group from the kingdom of the Middle Angles or from the South Saxons. So there's a multiplicity of names that people might have recognised at the time But it's important to remember that this changes over time. And really, the Kingdom of England doesn't come into existence as a territorial entity until the 10th century. We're very much going to be touching on the different kingdoms in a moment. But first, I just wanted to situate us in the story. And just could you provide us with perhaps a brief timeline of the Anglo-Saxons? Okay, so I've already mentioned the, if you like, the end of Anglo-Saxon England. And that's a really easy one to remember. We're all taught about the Norman conquest, uh, you know, the Bear Tapestry, the arrival of the Norman armies on on the southern coast of England in in 1066. So really, those closing decades of the 11th century are the the closing period of Anglo-Saxon England. But the earliest phases of Anglo-Saxon England, the Anglo-Saxon activity, really come in the 5th century. Um, We've got clues before that, but it's really in the 5th century that... uh, classic transition period between the withdrawal of the Roman armies in the early 5th century and the the beginnings of the appearance of people who seem to be crucially Germanic speakers. And it's really the the speakers of these Germanic languages, which is our our clue that these are the people whose descendants 
become known by that label Anglo-Saxon. So it's from the mid 5th century, really, right the way up through to the mid to late 11th century. So how were the kingdoms first established then? Well, in the, in the 5th and 6th centuries, we're, we're in the realm principally of archaeology rather than our historical sources. We do have a few historical sources, and, and the main one that we have is a, is, a, is a very important text written by a man called Gildas, who seems to have been a Briton, writing about these terribly aggressive people who have appeared and are doing such destruction to the world that, that, that he knew. Um, so in the 5th and 6th centuries, if we're looking at the archaeology, we can see groups of people who are being buried or burying communities in a different way to what had happened under Romana British uh, rule. And while we can't necessarily apply political geography to those groups, we can begin to see, at least in the burial patterns, the, um, the emergence of areas that seem to be under the influence of these new cultural groups that we think of as Anglo-Saxons and were almost certainly Germanic speakers. This brings me on to a question that we've actually had from Katie Bodie and Andre Cito 83 on Instagram and Facebook. And they've both asked about the interaction that the Anglo-Saxons had with these people that they displaced. And they've also asked about how integrated or displaced they, this local population was. That's such a good question. And it's such an interesting one, too not least because it's an area where our storyline is changing um, and we're actually getting a lot more uh, information coming through now than what we've had previously. So if we had been working simply from the historical records that we have, which I've already said are, are dispersed and sparse and very biased and partial and often retrospective, we would have a, um, a view of the Romano Britons being killed or displaced, forced out of their territories uh, and being replaced wholesale by uh, military groups, followed by the settlement of, of, um, of followers coming from the near continent. Um, and indeed, one of our very best sources, writing in the early 8th century, the Venerable Bede in Northumbria, he uh, is clearly very disparaging of the Britons who remained in his own, in his own day. So we've got the voice there of somebody who is a, an intellectual and a scholar in the early 8th century who um, thinks very little of the Britons of his own day. But in doing so, in being quite rude about them, he also tells us that they're still there, that they still exist and that he has some form of connection and contact with them. But the archaeology, in fact, is what is is providing us with a new key and with really a different narrative here um so i've already mentioned the you know the the burial remains and the uh, cremation urns giving way to um inhumation burials that's one way in which archaeology can help us to uh start to see the phases of if you like germanic culture becoming established uh in lowland britain but the real breakthrough, actually, and the really interesting, intriguing evidence is, is likely to come through ancient DNA and actually being able to look at the, um, uh, the genomes of the individuals who were buried in those cemeteries. And we're right at the cusp of this revolution. Um, we've used ancient DNA in, in recent years really to understand the deep, deep time human history. DNA's got the potential really to unlock a uh, more recent history as well. And we can do that through looking at the biological remains, the genomes of the people who were um, alive at the time and, and buried. And what this seems to be beginning to show us, and you have to do this by comparing with, um, with data from the near continent as, as well, and with southern Scandinavia, is that we do seem to be able to increasingly have confidence in distinguishing between genomes that would have been familiar on the continent with uh, those that were on the islands beforehand. And that's where we're starting to get evidence both of people who are likely to be incomers, but also of uh, admixture between the two populations. The follow-up question that I'm sure you're going to ask me next, so I'll ask it for you, is that um, 
the genome, somebody's genome tells one story, but the genome cannot in and of itself tell us what that person felt like or how they self-identified at the time. So even when we get this this new scientific data coming out of the out of the bones, um, it it will still provide just one more piece of evidence rather than necessarily unlocking the answer to how people felt and identified at the time. And you know, if you ask me, I'm perfectly sure that people then, as now, could carry multiple identities in their life and changing through their life as well. This is such a fascinating part of the story. Is is there anything else you'd particularly like to touch on about this particular part? I guess the genetics has has had um, a two part development so far. There was a, a lot of work that was done a decade or so ago uh, using modern genomes to try and understand, if you like, historical populations. And you can do that to an extent, but it always has that sort of limitation of a real distance from the period that uh, we're so interested in. The breakthrough is using ancient DNA and crucially what's happened in in the last few years, by which I mean the last two or three years, is that the the cost of doing the analysis has really come down. So whereas, you know, five or six years ago, this would have cost £10,000 to do one genome, we're now talking £1,000 and it'll come down and down from, from that. And that's when we can start to do the really exciting work, you know, looking at the genetics of an entire cemetery rather than the ones that stand out as being a little bit different from from the um, from the contents of the grave. That that would be my my dream would be to to do some complete cemetery analyses because then you would start to get relationships between groups as well as that of individuals. And indeed, this is beginning to happen, but it's baby steps so far. It's very exciting. And that's where the, that's where the cutting edge technology can, uh, can, can really make a difference. From those earliest times, what exactly changed after the, the fifth and sixth century? The fundamental thing that, that changes our story after the fifth and sixth centuries is that we suddenly start getting the appearance of written records. We had a few before then, but, you know, scant. At, you know, very, very small uh, numbers and sources before that. But round about 600, one of the big fundamental changes happens, which is the beginnings of the conversion of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to Christianity. And this happens through um, missions coming to England from Rome. But the crucial difference is that they bring with them the technology of reading and writing. So, Britain had had access to literacy previously. And as I've said, there's some evidence that this is maintained in at least the Britonic speaking parts of the country through the fifth and sixth centuries. But the pagan Anglo-Saxons were illiterate. They were not using the written word except um, very sporadically with runic inscriptions on you know, a few objects, but this wasn't in any sense sustained writing. Christianity brings with it the skills of reading and writing, the technology of reading and writing, as well as the Latin language. And within a very few years of circa 600, sources start being written from within Anglo-Saxon England, predominantly in Latin, though there is some evidence of Old English being written down at the time as well. Um, and this, if you like, opens the the box of historical evidence, so written evidence. So through the 7th century, not only do we have the evidence of archaeology, which is still incredibly rich through the 7th century, but that is also supported by growing volumes of written evidence. And increasingly through the 7th century, written evidence that comes from the peoples of Britain themselves, rather than outsiders writing about them. So we get this big shift uh, round about 600. 600 is the kind of watershed from where we're overwhelmingly dependent on the archaeological evidence to into the 7th century, where that starts to be enriched with historical evidence, contemporary sources written down as well. I guess while we're touching on the religious, could I just ask you, what did the religious organisation and also practice look like at this time? We've got not much evidence of religious practice 
before circa 600 where where we do identify religious rituals through uh, burial practice and things of that sort it it requires us as archaeologists or historians to interpret what we're seeing in the ground rather than any direct evidence of belief systems or or practices at the time so we we can quite confidently say that people at the time in the in those um germanic speaking areas were were almost certainly pagan rather than following anything that resembled Christianity. Though it's likely that there is some persistence of Christianity in areas that, in in some parts of Britain. So around, for example, St Albans, that's a place where we know the cult of St Albans carried on through the 5th and 6th centuries and was known about in in the 7th century. So there, there were almost certainly pockets of Christian Britain still um, still around, but there's precious little direct evidence of, of of either their practices or indeed of the um, the religious practices of the Germanic speaking Anglo-Saxon populations that they lived among. Um, with the beginnings of the conversion um, by the Roman missionaries starting in Canterbury, they start to roll out as as the various kingdoms start to convert. Um, or not just access to the written word, access to scripture, but that comes with the beginnings of a Christian institutional organisation. And in fact, that is then what's key to the growth of kingdoms there afterwards as well. So in the 7th century, we start to get bishops and uh, being associated with particular locations with bishoprics and from the 630s onwards, really, the beginnings of individual monasteries that then uh, create other monasteries as well. So the beginnings of monastic networks. It's that ecclesiastical hierarchy and that ecclesiastical network that really is is a profoundly useful tool for kings, um, not just in their, if you like, their justification for rulership in this new Christianized world, but also because it gives them an institutional hierarchy through which they can operate as well. And it's an institutional hierarchy that's literate. And the tools of literacy enable kings to govern differently and rule wider areas more efficiently. So conversion to Christianity might have been for genuine reasons of faith, but it also gives kings a technological advantage and an organisational advantage, which helps support and facilitate the growth of kingdoms. So this is something that we've got so many questions on from our listeners. Absolutely loads. I can't tell you enough. So while we're talking about the idea of governance by kings, could you tell us a little bit more about how they ruled in terms of perhaps their economics, their law, justice, social order as well? If we take... um two of those elements first so there's um there's the economics and then there's the um the 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 law and justice side of things if we start with the economics one of the ways that we can we can see this in practice is actually through the coinage so the 5th and 6th centuries we don't have any coinage uh, through most of the 7th century we we start to get the beginnings of the use of coin in in England initially they're using coin from Francia, so Merovingian Francia, they're using imported coin um, and it's not necessarily as a um, as a medium of exchange. Um, and if it is, it's very high value. So, you know, gold coins. So the famous Sutton Hoo ship burial had um, a purse with Merovingian gold coins in it. Now that's the treasure of a king. Yeah. Um, so you couldn't go out and buy a loaf of bread or a sheep with one of those coins. You'd have bought the whole flock and probably the land on which they were um, they were being grazed as well. Um, you see a beginnings of a shift in the coinage where from this gold coinage that's borrowed from Francia to a silver coinage. And again, the silver is being imported. But with a silver coinage, it, it's beginning to enter, if not everyday use, it's coming into circulation for a wider section of the population. From about 750, um, the coinage suddenly becomes explicitly royal. So from about 750, the kings are putting their names on the coinage and you can start to associate them with um, specific kingdoms. 
Before that, we're looking at spreads of coins that seem to be to do with North Sea trade networks um, because we're getting similar coins being minted in southern Denmark and what's now the Netherlands. And these seem to be exchanged interchangeably in those parts of Francia and across into, into England as, as well. So there was this kind of North Sea economic network that was was active and vibrant in the early part of the 8th century. From the middle years of the 8th century and through into the later 8th century, um, you get a silver coinage that, again, tracks what's happening in Francia, but it's overtly royal. And that's a really big shift. Um, and coins continue to be minted um, all the way through up to the end of the period. And from the 10th century, we can see that kings are uh, reissuing coinages on a on a on an increasingly regular basis as a means of controlling the money supply and controlling the flow of silver into their coffers as well. So coinage um, becomes from the 10th century something far more like we would recognise today as an economic um, mode of exchange, but also as a medium of of wealth concentration, but also uh, crucially taxation. Uh, through the 10th and 11th centuries. Don't forget, and I'm sure we'll come on to this later, that it's um, when the Vikings are turning up in the late 9th and into the, the 10th and round about the year 1000, they're coming to England because of its wealth, um, because of its great supplies of bullion, um, as well as its other types of resources. England is a rich place. Your other question was about law. Um, so uh, law codes, again, is fantastic because we can um, we can look at law across almost the whole of our period. So coins and law codes are something that we get across almost the whole of our period. The earliest law codes we get are from the um, from the early 7th century. So we got these law codes and crucially they're written in English. They're our first sort of major sustained piece of writing in uh, Old English rather than, than in Latin. Um, and then we get a series of law codes, again, from the time of King Alfred up until the conquest where codes are issued really very regularly by kings thereafter. So uh, law codes are fantastic, um, not just because they're written in English, but because they show a kind of changing attitude towards the concept of law and the king's role in that process. So the earliest codes that we've got from, from the 7th century are really based on the idea of a feud, um, the old Germanic idea of feud. So a king would be adjudicating a case whereby the outcome of it would be it would be in the in the um, the remit of the family of the person who had been wronged to uh, get the compensation. Over the course of the whole period, so when we start getting the codes in the the later ninth and tenth and eleventh centuries, you see a, a real shift um, to ideas of law being about crimes against, not just against the individual, but against society as a whole. And so the king is is acting, if you like, as the representative of society and making judgments um, against individuals for what is deemed a, a crime against the society as a whole. And that's, that again is a, is, is a change across the period from the individual to, um, to this kind of social obligation. And the idea that law is a way of managing society within that. It's based on an idea, it's still based on an idea of compensation from the, in the 10th century and, you know, under Canute and others in particular, the death penalty is, is, is commonplace. And when the, the death penalty eases slightly, they, they, there are all sorts of absolutely kind of hideous mutilations that are put in place of, of the death penalty. So it's not necessarily less gory than, um, than it had been. But as I say, there's this, this shift with this idea that kings are there to adjudicate crimes that are against social norms and against society as a whole and not just crimes against a, an, an individual. This brings me on to a question we've actually had from Chris Rowe on X, so formerly Twitter. It's about what did it actually take to become a king? Was it a matter of brute force? Was it family connections? Or was it having the sheer brains for it? Uh, almost certainly a combination of both. And when you talk about brains, that's uh, political nous, I think, as much as anything else. We do get dynasties emerging in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. 
So evidently, um, the family that you're born into matters a lot. And this is borne out as well by the use of what we call genealogies um, that survive, where you, you need to be able to show that you are of the right bloodlines in order to have the, the, the right to rule. So often at the moments of dynastic change, the new dynasty will come in and in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle or some other source, there's a, um, a, a genealogy is put in to demonstrate the veracity of their claim back to these historical and kind of semi-mythical ancestors as well. And indeed, some of those mythical ancestors, semi-mythical ancestors include people like Woden, so going back to those Germanic gods, hoovering them up. They then, they then end up back in uh, you know, Adam as well. It's important to show um, ancestry back to those to legitimise your, your, your right to rule. So bloodlines matter, um, but it is comparatively unusual for a son to succeed a father. Yeah, it's more to do with family connections. It does happen, but that, I wouldn't have said that's the that's not the the norm. Um, brute force military might, you know, they're war leaders. A king has to be able to lead in 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 battle. Um, even our most erudite Anglo-Saxon king, King Alfred had to be able to, you know, had to be able to lead his troops into battle or to be able to command. You also had to be a politician alongside being an effective war leader because there's always somebody standing in the wings waiting for that weak moment and wait for the uh, the opportunity to take to take power. So through the 8th century, there are a series of um, extremely uh, powerful kings of Mercia, both Athelbald and then uh, King Offa. But both of them come to power at a time of flux and change and dynastic change. And Athelbald is murdered eventually. They're very long-lived kings. I always think long-lived kings demonstrates that they must be doing something right during their, during their rules. But um, Athelbald comes unstuck at the end and is murdered. Offa unusually manages to pass his uh, crown onto his son but his son survives him by a matter of 141 days. And then there are these cryptic comments about his death and whether he died because of the sins of his father, um, which rather suggests that this might not have been a natural death. So it's a combination of all three, brute force, bloodlines uh, and political agility. We should probably talk about the kingdoms as, um, themselves, actually. Could you break it down? What kingdoms were there? I, Robert Keynes on Facebook has said about were there really seven or was this just a convenient number given by later historians? We've also had lots of questions about how we would define boundaries as well. Okay, so the, the figure seven is a late um, idea. It's a 12th century one. The 12th century historians writing about Anglo-Saxon England um, talk about the heptarchy, the seven kingdoms. But they're, they're, they're really projecting backwards onto a particular period uh, of time. Um, and, you know, if we look closely enough, we could find a time where there were seven kingdoms and that would be, you know, convenient and it matches that. Um, but we're really looking across the period as a whole of a time. Um, it's more of a, of a move from many kingdoms to one consolidated kingdom of England. And depending on where you stop the clock, you would get a different figure for the numbers of kingdoms. As I've said, the, the single kingdom of England really emerges in the early decades of the of the 10th century. And that's under Alfred's grandson, a man called Athelstan, who calls himself uh, the king of the English. He's the first person to use that term. It's the king of the English. So it's the people, not um, a defined territorial identity, yeah. So that gets us onto the the problem with with boundaries. But if you um, scroll back through time, um, you would find different numbers of kingdoms at any particular point. We can we can see this through back to around about six hundred. Before that, it's much more murky. But if we um, filter the works of say. Bede, who was writing in Northumbria, the northernmost of those Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in the early years of the 8th century, we can see larger kingdoms and smaller political groups 
within them or being incorporated by them. So the period that Bede was writing about, so he was writing in the 730s and he's looking back into the 7th century. In his day, there are seven or eight major kingdoms. But the period he's writing about, he talks about the um, the increasing consolidation of those kingdoms and their um, amalgamation and, um, you know, hoovering up the sort of smaller political entities that had been in existence before that. So from his work, we can both see some of that process of amalgamation, but also extrapolate to the likelihood of there having been originally many uh, smaller polities that were perhaps under the rule of one um, particularly powerful local lord. And eventually over time, those become um, amalgamated into larger political entities. Um, as I suggested before, that's almost certainly part and parcel and possibly even a consequence of the conversion to Christianity, which enables with the advent of um, that technology of reading and writing, kings and rulers to be able to rule increasingly larger areas. So while we can see in the historical records this um, development from many kingdoms to one kingdom of England, it's also important to step back from that and realise that the single unified kingdom of England was at, at no point was that inevitable, but that it was a, a kind of consequence of um, historical events. And really the crucial historical events are in the century we haven't said much about, which is the ninth century, with the appearance of the Vikings off the shores of Britain. Because when the Vikings start to do more than just their kind of ram raids on the coast, um, in the middle decades of the ninth century, they start to knock out the ruling elite of really three out of the four major kingdoms. So the ruling families of East Anglia, the ruling families of Northumbria, um, and indeed also of Mercia, are removed, which leaves only Wessex as the really the sole surviving Anglo-Saxon kingdom with its traditional family in charge. And it's out of that West Saxon kingdom that what becomes the Kingdom of England eventually emerges. When the Vikings came over, what was the experience like for the average Anglo-Saxon person? Did they coexist? What was the life like for the average uh, Anglo-Saxon? Well, probably initially utterly terrifying um, because, you know, there, there were pirates on the shore and they, these people were coming inland. And through the course of the ninth century, you know, they start with these... Um, these raids on the on the the English coast, then they start coming inland more. Then they start overwintering, and the um, the the armies start getting bigger. And there's this regime change happening in large parts of the the country as the as the ruling elite are taken out and English armies are defeated. So you know the chances are for ordinary people this would have been a very alarming uh, period to to live through. Um, but having said that, we've also got plenty of evidence of there being a lot of uh, interaction, particularly, as you say, north and east of the line of Watling Street, um, uh, the old Roman road, in an area that by the 10th century is, is, is labelled Dane law. So in areas where people were living under the, the law of the Danes rather than the law of the, the, the English. Naming patterns, place names which obviously get written down principally first at Doomsday, show considerable evidence of Norse-speaking people who have sufficient influence to and sufficient numbers to affect the uh, names of villages and fields and you know, uh, places in, in the country. And so that level, uh, and indeed uh, the English language, um, is deeply affected by Scandinavian syntax and things of that sort, at a level which suggests considerable mixing of populations of English speakers with speakers of old, particularly of old, of old Norse and old Danish. So 
the historical sources, again, it's, it's, a, it's one of these examples where the historical sources would give us one narrative. But if we look at other types of evidence, we can see perhaps a different type of picture emerging. Personal names are, are very interesting because it's hard to tell, again, what the individual identity of those people, of those individuals would have, would have been. Um, just because you're called Svein, does that mean that you um, came from a family that had its origins in Norway? Or have your parents called you that because they think it's uh, maybe a politically wise thing to do? You know, the landlord might approve of you if you had a, had one of these newfangled trendy names. But there, there does seem to be, particularly in you know the northern Midlands and up into um, up into Yorkshire in particular and across into East Anglia, not only considerable use of Old Norse uh, Scandinavian languages in the naming patterns of places, but also increasing numbers of people who. Uh, used personal names that suggest Scandinavian um, uh, cultural influence, if not Scandinavian heritage directly. Speaking about change and continuity, what happens about when the Normans arrived? Which Anglo-Saxon traditions were perhaps accepted? And were there some that any were got rid of? (laughs) Okay, so um, in the 11th century, the first thing to remember is that the Norman conquest is just one of two conquests. There had been an earlier Scandinavian conquest at the beginning of the 11th century when uh, Canute uh, the Great, already king of Denmark, later king of Norway, uh, took um, the throne of England from Ethelred the Unready. And he, he, he ruled for you know, 1016 to 1035 and the evidence suggests in a, in a profoundly effective way. So by 1066, England has already had um, a Scandinavian ruler, a Viking ruler as king, and a king who had been thoroughly accepted and absorbed by the Anglo-Saxon noble e- e- elite. So 1066 can be presented as this moment of revolution, of change, but it's also one that comes really on the um, on the tail of and the tail wind of a conquest um, fifty years before. So for the, at least the nobles at the time, this would have been something that um, they may not have had direct memory of, but certainly in a generation earlier would have remembered that earlier conquest. Um, but into what what do we have in terms of transition, um, change, and continuity at the Norman conquest? Doomsday Book really is one of our key pieces of sources here because it gives us the evidence from um, the land holding at the time of King Edward, so Edward Confessor, um, in comparison to 1086 when Doomsday Book was put put together, so under uh, under William. So you can do a compare and contrast. And one of the things that seems to have fallen away uh, in that period is particularly slavery, in fact, that there are fewer people who are are labelled as slaves they still are likely to have had an indentured relationship with the land. So they may not have themselves understood quite the distinction, but it is um, that does appear it through, through those sources. Um, in terms of continuity, the most important evidence that we've got for continuity of, of, of people, really, is the continuity of the use of the English language. So we, we still talk English today, that that we still talk English today is partly a consequence of that continuity from the 10th and 11th centuries through this period of conquest um, uh, and political change at the end of the 11th century. And English remained the language of um, the vast majority of people under Anglo-Norman rule. The elite would have been speaking Anglo-Norman French and Latin, um, but English maintains its status as a spoken and written language within the Kingdom of England after the Norman Conquest. As my final question for you, I don't know if this is a fair one because it's a little bit of a counterfactual question. Mm -hmm. And that's if it hadn't been for these two conquests, how long do you think that the Anglo-Saxons could have stayed in power for? This is a question we've had from Sweden-Hungary on... It is a counterfactual because who knows, I think, is the answer. To that, but it's important to um, to look back across the early centuries and to realise how much change there there had been, and thinking also about what was happening in 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 Europe at the time as well. 
in many ways, it's not so much about who the ruling elite is as to the continuity of the vast bulk of the population underneath. And I think in many ways we can see that there was that continuity all the way through. It's also important to say that the new Norman kings were very, very keen to identify with those earlier Anglo-Saxon dynasties and their predecessors as a way of legitimising their rule and their authority within a kingdom that was where overwhelmingly the people had that continuity from, from, from earlier times. So you might get regime change at the top, but there's population continuity underneath it and language continuity that goes with it. Actually, I've got another cheeky question, if you don't mind, and that is just from Lynn Price on Facebook. I think it's just a really interesting tidbit to finish off with, and that's how did the Anglo-Saxons design and manufacture such tiny, exquisite, intricate jewellery? I wish I knew because I would then be a <laughs> a very rich individual. It's 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 very hard to tell. But what I would say is that the that the jewellery um, is is one manifestation of this extraordinary talent and this ability to create very intricate designs on a very small scale that are things of utter beauty. What I would encourage your listener to do is to look also at the manuscripts where you can see exactly the same type of ability coming through in the way that people were designing and making uh, books. So it's things like the Lindisfarne Gospels, for example, you know, which you can see on the British Library website. Is a, is, is, it's beyond comprehension, really, how that level of detail could have been done by human eye. What we do know is that they're using geometry, they're using, they're using maths, they're using the tools um, of mathematics to help them with this. But there is no doubt that if you look across at metalwork and through into manuscripts, that you've got groups of superlative artists and craftsmen who were able to work at the very top of their craft and with complete command and control of the materials that they needed, whether that is pigment and parchment or metalwork and, and precious stones. It's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. And, um, you know, some of the, the greatest craftsmen, I think, of really ever from, our, um, from these islands were, were living and working at, at this time. <laughs> 